What's up, peeps? Starting the Tanzu Tuesday stream. We got a bunch of cool folks here joining us today. It's our normal host, Lee, and me, and Tiffany. Tiffany just <laughs> has a little different look about her this week. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Tiffany, you're looking great. Appreciate <laughs> it. It's the lighting, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, friends, if you if you haven't seen uh, Dan's content, uh, Dan's a new team member with the uh, with the Tanzu Advocacy team. Uh, he's been been with us since what January or so. Yeah, I'm coming up on a month uh, this Thursday, so seems like a year already. Just been having a lot of fun, and yes, yeah, so I'm doing work on the you know I'm Spring Developer Advocate, so focusing on Spring. Uh, had a presentation last week have a couple coming up this week so just enjoying uh being part of this team and and producing some content so yeah so definitely you know if you're joining us or watching the recording uh drop some love for dan uh you can follow him at uh, the real dan vega on twitter it's not no imitations uh, of <laughs> course today's guest uh we have you all know scott scott rosenberg uh, what's up scott hey, everyone. how are you doing thanks hey, for good us. hey everyone how are you so great. Awesome. We just had a holiday yesterday in the States, so we're all super rested. If you can't <laughs> tell by our vibrant complexions. True, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, maybe even some people might still be on holiday, right? Definitely has that Monday vibe going on today. So. <laughs> Yeah, apparently the uh, the forecast for tomorrow in the uh, Colorado Rockies is going to be like three to seven inches of snowfall. Uh, so that's going to be pretty yeah. incredible. I think I'm going to get up there tonight and do some snowboarding in the morning, which is going to be awesome. So, nice. 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 Yeah. Yesterday, um, for my day off, I hung out with some goats. There's a, I don't drink, but there's a brewery nearby that I like because it's all like sustainable and they grow what they can. And they have a pack of 50 Nigerian dwarf goats that um, is basically their lawnmowers. They take the goats out on walks like twice a day to eat the grass. Hello. Oh, wow. What's yeah. up to everyone uh, joining us How's in the going? chat here? I know we're getting, getting started with our, our uh, beginning stream banter here, uh, Java Grunt. <laughs> And Vitale Thomas, we got the fluffy, fluffy Sistop joining in. Hello, friends. It'll be cool to see you joining the stream um, next month, Robert. Thanks for coming and attending. And uh, yeah, uh, just kind of talking about what's been going on, uh, what we did over the, the long weekend. Whitney was yeah. saying, uh, you, so they had goats. Yeah, they had goats. It's, so you, you actually sign up for a goat tour. It's called the Goat Experience. So I got a group of friends together and we all went and experienced the goat, <laughs> the goats together, which is just That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. When, and then, when you said goats, I thought you meant like greatest of all time. <laughs> 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 Not actual goats. <laughs> no, literal goats and they all had blue eyes. But um, I they, they, yeah. I, I would like it if the goat like served me. You know, like the, like the server would walk the goat over and it had like a you know, furnaces with like, yeah, like a silver platter on top. You know, they have to, they can't fill the whole cup with beer or else it would like splash too much. You know? That, of course, is. Or maybe they have a lid instead, like pour the cup and then, you know. I think know. you're really on to something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would pay extra money. Um, for a goat nice delivered beer, it's an option. On the back of goat. <laughs> Those of you in chat who had um, time, extra time off this weekend, or just an interesting weekend, what did y'all do? Yeah, yeah. Did do this I'll um, weekend? I'll go sh go ahead and share. I got a yeah. I got a new treadmill. I like to run, but I'm outside of Cleveland, and when it's zero degrees outside, I don't like to run outside. Uh, I'm very much a when it's nice out, I'll run outside, but. Outside of that, I'm running inside. So I had a treadmill for a while. I finally, you know, had the ability to get a new one. 
And I was like, all right, I'm going to try and get this NordaTrack one. It's got this like LCD on it. And it has these workouts where you can like run with a trainer like anywhere in the world. And so yesterday I did a run in um, in San Diego in Torrey Pines along the Pacific Ocean. Whoa. And I, the only way I can describe it is just blissful. Like I'm running along the ocean. You're so immersed in it that as he like jumps over a rock, I felt like I had to like jump with him. Wow. And he's just telling you like, you know, when you should like pick up the pace and then like the um, incline goes up and down, the speed goes automatically up and down as, as he does. So and like it's enough to really, really trick your senses and to really feel yeah. like yeah it, and, and there's like there's like you, breeze, maybe some ocean smells like are there any well, other <laughs> there's no smells that would be great but yeah i mean it's big enough to where like you're just like staring at this beautiful ocean because normally when you run on a treadmill you're staring at a screen with numbers on it and it just gets yeah. old really really quick yeah so this like 40 minute run was like it, it felt like five minutes because it was just like fun and relaxing so just a yeah. quick tip if anybody out there likes to run on treadmills Try and find um, one of these treadmills with like these live training sessions. Uh, they're so much. They're so much better. Super cool. Yeah. Why do so, I use that? Oh, sorry. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say um, that it, in the cloud native community, uh, actually, uh, EPPF nerd Liz Rice, um, she competes in virtual cyclothons. Whoa. Right. So awesome. like it's yeah, like she's on a team, right? Like you can see like people pulling up and like passing each other like virtually. Whoa. You know? And you can get like points and like boosts and stuff and it's it's like a big thing, you know. So she's You know, big. that's that that makes me think of another thing we we've all talked about like the metaverse before. Maybe that would be something that could be very like immersive in like the metaverse is like training with other people, whether it's like Lifting yeah, like some weights at home, class, or running. Uh, yeah, in like that would VR be really camp. cool. Yeah, I, I think they probably have that already. <laughs> yeah, guess. they do. I'm sure it's not where it can be, but like mm -hmm. you can imagine where it can get to. Like that would be super fun to do uh, right from your home. Scott, maybe uh, we can start our running group. You know, I'll ship you an Oculus Quest. <laughs> Sound good to you? I am more than happy to give that to someone else here that likes to run. <laughs> <laughs> You can pretend it's you, though. It's a really good one. I, I can be there supporting you if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, Where's the not, cheerlead function? The brilliant thing about the, the metaverse is that no one needs to know that it isn't you. You know? <laughs> exactly. Just give somebody your login, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know? I'm running. Can't you tell? I'm running right now. <laughs> Or like, I want the arts and craft app so I can make you a really motivational sign for when you do it and hold it up. That's awesome. <laughs> I picture a lot of running into walls with the Oculus on, though. <laughs> that part up. Oh yeah. You you have me imagining now that if I just take an electric bike and like prop it up and mount the headset to the seat, <laughs> and then the controllers to the pedals, and then I leave it on. That the, that the arms would just like, you know? <laughs> and, and you could just set records, you know, marathon pace at, at that point. And, uh, All right, Scott, when you have a longer weekend or maybe this past weekend, what's something you like to do with your time outside of work? Yeah, you know, I I really enjoy traveling actually a lot for long yeah. weekends. Um, you know, in winter months I love skiing. Um, we don't really have that much out in this neck of the woods in Israel. Uh, uh -huh. Not too much great skiing. I, we have skiing, but it's about like skiing in Wisconsin uh, uh -huh. for those in the states. So it's not really the <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, short flight to. Uh, the Dolomites or, you know, anywhere else in Europe. So not too bad. Um, but no, I, I really love traveling. Um, you know, just hanging out with family is really what I like to do on weekends. Weekends, I'm usually just going and spending a lot of time with family uh, and having fun. Um, I have you know. a question for you, Scott, uh, because yeah. I, I love skiing and snowboarding, but I'm very uneducated about the tilt of the earth and like seasons 
-hmm. when when is like winter <laughs> like in those places on which half of the globe uh on your <laughs> half yeah <laughs> you know same as you uh we're the same as you know whatever europe us are the same winters so same timing basically okay so didn't you just say it was 80 degrees today or something yeah <laughs> yeah welcome to the middle east <laughs> that's this that's summer's... nothing like our winter <laughs> exactly you know it's uh you know but it's no I and mean, we've had some rain we've had some you know whatever we had snow this year which we get usually like once in a decade um we had snow you know maybe two three inches and everything shuts down from like one inch of snow the country will completely shut down because yeah. you have no snow plows you don't have salt you don't have like you don't have everything that you need in order to actually deal with snow and 90 percent of cars are not four-wheel drive so good luck uh, <laughs> the snow starts falling and people are just like, yeah, we're not dealing with this today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, the amount of people that I know that actually have like their cars have been completely like total lost. I just destroyed it because people don't use antifreeze here because it just doesn't get that cold. So they just have regular water and it freezes inside their engine and uh, okay. have fun then. Uh, <laughs> so. Wow. Life pro tips don't recommend freezing your engine. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if it's feasible uh, in the, the end of May timeline uh, for KubeCon Valencia if if skiing on that side of the globe is going to be a thing. So uh, uh, no, it won't no. be in May. All right, we're we're canceling the KubeCon Valencia <laughs> ski trip, friends. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's uh just not going to work this year. So. Mm. You have to be, wait We're for getting... the winter time KubeCon NA. <laughs> exactly. Where is it in Colorado this year, right? I think it, so. Is it? Oh, man, that would be so cool. I think I saw Denver. I yeah, think it's in Denver okay. this year. Well, if it lands more in the November time frame than in the October time frame. Um, but if it's October, there's probably not many resorts open, unfortunately. So. Yeah. But you can come Great. back a month later and I will go skiing with you. Open invite to anybody on the stream. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll try it out. I'll be hanging out of the bunny hill, but I'll do it. Um, I will totally take you skiing, Whitney. That'd be awesome. <laughs> or snowboarding, whatever you want to try out. So. Yeah, heck yeah. So we're getting some questions in the chat. Um, I think this is first, Scott, are you getting more frequent warm or cold weather at that latitude? Uh, so we don't have frequent cold here at this latitude. We get frequent warm 365 okay. days a year. Um, I remember I was speaking about two weeks ago with my grandfather who was in Chicago because I grew up there. That's where my you know extended family is. And I remember mm -hmm. talking to him and we realized that we had the exact same temperature both in Chicago and in Israel. Just uh -huh. by then it was you know, it's just a question of Fahrenheit versus Celsius, and it was the same degrees, you know. <laughs> and then so. Pokisitan is saying that they see warmer and warmer winters in the Netherlands. I'm in yeah. Austin. It feels like, based on what you're saying about Israel, that Austin, Texas is about the same as what you are, because we don't have ice trucks, or we don't, it's very rare for things to freeze here, and it also shuts down the city. Um, Java yeah. Crunt wants to know, are block heaters a thing in Colorado? So I, I know a little bit about this esoteric kind of device that you might have on your car. And it's uh, it's more common for something that would be starting an alternative fuel like diesel or ethanol 85. Uh, yeah, a lot of people in my old Subaru club with their um, E85 tunes. Um, it's, a, it's a higher octane fuel uh, for non cornered people. Uh, it tends to be a little bit harder to start up your car if the engine block is at like below freezing temperatures. So you sometimes get this, you know, um, block heater device to help the ignition uh, chamber be a little bit more suitable. So, yeah. yeah. Cool question. In North, in North Dakota, we plug in our vehicles, says Java Grunt, in the winter. A block heater keeps the entire thing from freezing. Cool. Okay. Oh, and Scott, more for you. We need to know. Oh, it looks like the fluffy sysop is going to Israel in about a month. They need to know what type of clothing to pack. 
Don't worry. We'll, uh, I'll hook you up. We'll, uh, talk over Slack and I will, uh, and we will also be meeting up here. So awesome. Yeah. That is the, the trick though, is, is knowing what to pack. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and having a good packing system. Right. It's like when you're going to be crossing, crossing the ocean, taking several luggage with you, you got to know exactly what's inside it. And today <laughs> our guest is going to be showing us a tool set. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so that you can keep track of exactly what you need. Right. Let's just make exactly. it easier. <laughs> oh, <no>. Exactly. <laughs> oh. That was a wonderful transition. <laughs> so yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at Carvel packaging. Yeah, a Are lot you of fun. Your up, uh, on uh, the, yeah, on the stream already. Yeah, here? yeah oh, let's yeah. share my screen here. Okay, um, probably so. Yeah, as well uh, for our mobile and TV viewers. There you go. All right. Yeah, no. So I, I think one of the really interesting uh, things that Tanzu has brought is really this idea of the Carvel packaging. Um, I think it's probably the one of the greatest things that Tanzu has brought, um, you know, or has come out to the open source community. And within that, I mean, the whole Carvel tool set is very interesting. Uh, we went into a lot of the uh, applications of that in uh, a previous Tanzu Tuesday with like customizing Tanzu Community Edition uh, and the same thing for TKGM uh, for Tanzu Kubernetes Grid Multi-Cloud for the commercial offering. Um, but I really think that packaging goes way beyond just, you know, the YTT and things like that for uh, manipulating how our clusters are configured or what gets done there automatically. And the Carvel packaging, I think, is really a game changer uh, when it comes to how we deploy applications on Kubernetes and how we manage them. Um, and what we're going to go through today is just looking at this idea of Carvel packaging and, you know, how I've approached this, um, looking also at how VMware have approached this from some of the packages that are released from VMware, um, and to really look at how this can be a unified package manager. Because one of the difficulties uh, that we've been seeing uh, in this world of Kubernetes in the cloud native landscape is that you have such a large, uh, you know, layout of tools out there and certain things come with a Helm chart and certain things come as an operator. Some things are just raw YAML. Some things are customized. Some things may be using YTT. Um, you have all of these different options of how these manifests, you know, arrive to you so that you can deploy them or how you would author those manifests. And one of the difficulties is that each of those tools has a different way of deploying it, different way of managing it, different way of managing its life cycle of updating it. And Carvel packaging really comes and gives us this holistic way of managing deployments of all different types through a very declarative and simple manner. Um, so we can use Carvel packaging to do things like YTT and KBuild and image package and use the actual uh, full Carvel tool set, but we can also use it, for example, with Helm. Um, we could package up a Helm chart. And that's the first thing that I wanted to show here um, is really how we could use, let's say, um, you know, a Helm chart, uh, how we could convert Helm charts into uh, packages. And so I actually built a tool to do this. Um, and if we look at this, I want to show kind of the approach of, you know, how I went about this from the initial, you know, incarnation of this type of tool. Um, and then where it kind of moved along to where it's much more robust today than it was at the beginning. Um, but if we go here, for example, to the KGM customizations repo, which is github.com slash vrabbi slash tkgm customizations um and here under the carvel packages folder um we have a bunch of packages that i built uh in the past so a good simple example before we get into the helm here would be for example the demo uh octave package um and this package here what we can see 
is that basically a package in the end is two folders. We have a config folder and we have another folder called .image package. Um, and all of our configuration actually is here in the config folder. And as we can see, this is standard YAML files. Um, there's one additional file beyond that. But if I were to look here at, for example, that to app.yaml, um, we can see here, this is using YPT. So I'm using YPT saying, hey, create a service account, create a cluster role binding. Again, we take the standard Kubernetes manifest. This is specifically built to deploy Octant in a read-only mode as a service on Kubernetes and then exposed via ingress. Um, but we have a standard Kubernetes YAML configured here. We have all of these things created, the ingress for contour, ingress TLS configuration, an overlay to apply those. And then what we also have is this very simple values.yaml. And this says, okay, these are the values, like a Helm values file, right? We have a Helm values file that lets us know which values can be configured. The same thing goes here with a package. A package also has the ability to say, hey, these are the values that I am exposing to my end user. So for example, here we say, do you want to install Octane plugins? The list of the plugins that you want us to install, which image, uh, the container image for Octant itself, the init container, the FQDN we want to expose the ingress for. And these are all just different values that we've exposed to our you know, end user through this package. These are values that they could supply to us. And this is really the simple part of building a package because once I have this done, I can very simply bundle this up. Um, so if I go back here, and let's actually go, yeah, let's do an image package uh, is the CLI we're gonna do. We're gonna do a, a push dash B and I'm just gonna tell it that's a bundle. So a package is a type of bundle. And I'm just gonna tell it where I want this saved. So I'm gonna say, let's say, no, let's save it to Harbor, make it easier. Harbor.vrabbi.cloud slash library slash octant package 0.1. So all I'm doing is pushing this here and I'm telling you which files I want to package. So we're going to run that and that pushed up my package for me. So great, I've got a package, but how do I actually go and deploy this, right? Um, so what we actually do once we've completed building a package, we built the actual object of that package, but now we need to actually have a YAML manifest of that package. So here, what I've done is if we do a CD here to my, let's see, demo package repo, and we look here and I go into packages, what we can see is that I actually have a folder here called octantterrasky.com. So let's look at what exists in there. We have two files. We have a metadata file, and then we have a version file. So if I do here a bat to metadata, this is a custom resource of Carvel called package metadata that we give it a name of what this package is, and we can give some general data of this package. There is nothing versioned here. This is the general description of what my application is. What is this octant.terrasky.com package? Um, so we explain what it is, and that's great. Then what we have is this 0.24 file. And here we actually are defining our package manifest, our declarative configuration of what a package is. So here the name is always going to be the package metadata name dot the version. So we have a very strong typing here of the version to the actual package metadata. Um, and then we can give release notes for this specific version. And then one of the great things that we have is we can actually add this thing here of value schema. So we can add an open API v3 schema that basically declares what is our actual configuration. What are the values that a user could supply to our package? Um, so you can see here, I've just built this out with, okay, what types of variables, are there defaults or not, um, you know, description of these things, um, and make it really simple for someone to be able to understand uh, what they could actually configure. And then 
what we actually have here is okay well how is this how does this package get deployed how does it actually get installed so i know what i could configure but how does it get deployed and that's where we have this template section which explains how we're going to go and deploy our application so the first thing that we have to do is fetch our source fetch those manifests and what we're going to use in this case is an image package bundle so this is again we just push with image package push minus b we pushed a bundle of our code up to a registry and now all i'm doing is saying okay i'm gonna fetch that bundle when this package is being installed and then i'm going to start templating it i'm going to run a ytt command on the config file uh, folder and then i'm going to run kbuild on all of the stdn and on the images.yaml file and then i'm going to deploy it using cap so it's going to do a cap deploy and basically this is a very declarative manner of what the three steps we are fetching templating and deploying and this is an example of using the entire Carvel tool set, right? So we're using the whole Carvel tool set to build out our actual application and deploy it. So what I could do very simply is just add these two files. I could go and do a ctl my dash f to metadata YAML, do a my dash f to 024 .yaml. And then if I did a QCPO get packages, we can see that here I now have within my cluster this idea of a package. Now, one of the great things that Tanzu brings also is the ability to actually now go and understand what these values are without needing to traverse a open API v3 schema. And so one of the things I can do is a Tanzu package available list. This is going to do the same thing as the Tanzu pack as the kubectl get packages, and it's going to give me the data here. And one of the things I could do is a Tanzu package available get to octantterrasky.com at a specific version. So that's going to be the 024. And say, hey, can I please have the value schema? So when I get the value schema here, this is going to print out, and I'm going to run this with a smaller screen so that it doesn't destroy everything, but we can see here that I can get, okay, what my keys are that I can supply, what the default is, what the type is, and what the description is of this specific field. So we get a really easy way of understanding what these configurations could be. And in order to install a package, what I could very simply do here is let's do a vi to value.yaml. Uh, let's call it octane values. And I'm just going to copy here that we are not going to use ingress in our case, uh, just because I don't have an ingress controller deployed here. Um, and we're actually going to, you know what, we're going to leave everything exactly as is. We're not going to set any values. We are happy with the defaults. So, can to package install. Give it a name, we'll call it octin demo dash p. So for the package itself, and this is going to be octin.terrasky.com. And then dash v for the version is going to be 0 0.24.0. And we don't need to pass anything else. I'm going to do enter. And what this is going to do is it's going to automatically come and start to install our package for us. Now what's so unique about this because okay we could have done a helm install i could have done an install with customize um and oh that's fun i had built this package originally that's the great thing with live demos i built this package originally and i was using ingress uh with v1 beta 1 but i'm on a kubernetes cluster that's too new for that so i don't have v1 beta 1 anymore um so i guess i can't install this package um but basically the idea is this is going to constantly reconcile for us so helm is simply going to do a helm install install once and that's it you could do a helm upgrade afterwards but it's a very it's a manually triggered process of upgrading a package of reconciling that package and one of the good examples of that is if i were just to do a helm let's say and let's do a helm install 
pack demo slash WordPress. Let's call it WordPress. Pack demo WordPress. Uh, and then do this in, and yeah, we'll do it in the default namespace with default values. So all we're doing is installing the WordPress uh, Bitnami help chart. So we have this set up here and find it at SVC. You can see that I've got this service. This one is load balancer. This one is cluster IP. But if I came right now and did a K edit to the service of WordPress, okay, and I decided, hey, I don't want this to be node. I don't want this to be a load balancer right now. I want this to be cluster IP. So we simply change the service. I come here. And now my declarative configuration of what I wanted in the cluster that I declared through my values YAML and Helm isn't actually what's applied to my cluster. And nothing right now, unless I go and do another Helm upgrade, nothing is going to reconcile that because the reconciliation is purely now Kubernetes level, but there's no higher level object saying what my application is and what the definition is that is being reconciled within Kubernetes. And that becomes very difficult to manage at scale. And so, and we end up having this big drift. So there are solutions to this. A lot of people have gone down the idea of GitOps, of let's just do a GitOps approach. We don't target our clusters directly. We push to Git our manifests and then use a tool like Flux or Argo CD or even Cap Controller. Um, and we can do GitOps through there. And that is definitely an option that exists. Um, but sometimes in certain use cases, also GitOps isn't necessarily the approach that we can use or that we want to use. And we may want to use the, we may want to have the ability to do an imperative command of, hey, please install this package for me. I may want to be able to do that, whether it's imperatively or through pipelines or GitOps or whatever, but what we want to be able to do is make sure that that application definition that I had configured is constantly reconciled, that no matter what, the cluster will fix itself. If I came and made a change, I want to make sure it fixes itself. So let's see how we could bring that to Helm. Let's bring this idea of packaging to Helm. So when I had originally looked at the package manifests on Carvel.dev, so let's take a look here as an example. And we're going to go to the website of carvel.dev. And on this website, we're going to go to cap controller and we're going to go to the documentation. And we're going to look here at the packaging. Or let's look at the app CR. And when I look at the spec for an application in cap controller, one of the things that we'll see here is that, okay, so we've got our spec. We could pause it, we could do all these different settings. And then this is that template that we had in our package. So how does it fetch? Then we have the templating and then we have the deploying state. And I was looking through this originally. And one of the things that I noticed was that actually we have a lot of options other than the Carvel tool set. So A, you could do inline if you wanted just to do some inline uh, values uh that you wanted just some manifests in line within the manifest of the package itself or the app um you could do paths from secrets or from config maps so you can save your manifests in the cluster and objects like that will you zoom in a little bit oh yeah thank you is that better yeah awesome right so we could do this fetching of you know from something within the cluster we could fetch things from like a cnab bundle or from a docker image that's just saved that has files within it. So I could actually pull down that image if I wanted to. Um, so we just give it the image URL. Um, we could give authentication, right? All of these different options that exist. Uh, we could do an image package bundle as we had seen before. Uh, you could pull just directly from HTTP, a tar GZ or a tar file. Um, we could pull from Git. So we could do full Git ops with a package and just point it to a Git repository that we want to fetch our manifests from. And another one that we had is this idea of a Helm chart. So we could actually come here and say, okay, which Helm repository, what version, and what chart 
am I trying to pull down its manifests now? And then we could run templating on that. So I could run YTT templating on that. I could go and run KBuild to actually resolve image references to use digest instead of tabs so that we're actually with immutable image references. Or I could use the Helm template command and actually just generate the manifest using the Helm templating engine. Um, and that's very easy to do. Uh, we could use SOPs for decrypting different values if we wanted to use Mozilla SOPs. And then we deploy with CAP. So CAP is currently the only option for deploying, um, which makes sense because it's the best deploying tool. Um, but for templating and for fetching, we have all of these different options. And I wanted to look at this for how I could do it for help. So the first attempt that I did uh, was very minimalistic, um, but it worked. Um, and if we look here, it's this folder called Vietnami Charts and Packages. And if we look here at what we actually did, um, so if I do a CD to Carvel Vietnami Packages, and I look at my packages, and we look here, this is the entire Bitnami Helm chart repository. Um, and let's take a look here, for example, at Apache. So if I go into the Apache folder, what we can see here is I've got my metadata file and I've got my version file, just like we had with the package that I had built manually for other things. But let's look at what actually this version file is doing. So A, we've got our value schema, which is the representation of all of our Helm values. But if we go down, what we're doing is, okay, I'm going to fetch this Helm chart. I'm going to run a Helm template command, and then I'm going to deploy it. So this is a very simple approach. And all we're doing is pulling down the Helm chart. We're running a Helm template and then doing a cap deploy. Right. So if we looked at that from a, you know, perspective of what that would look like from a CLI, that would be doing some approach like Helm pull Vietnami slash Apache dash dash unpar. And then you would be running something like Helm template to that specific directory. So that would be pulled into the directory called Apache. And then you would run on to that, uh, you would then run uh, basically a cap deploy dash a, you'd give it a name, app, and then minus, and then dash dash. Um, so you would say, hey, take whatever comes out of here, apply it through STDN. Yes, we're going to auto approve it and deploy the app called app. Awesome. So that's how basically what our package is doing for us. And that's a cool approach. But one of uh, the one of uh, the guys that I work with a lot from VMware in Israel, um, you know, in the Tanzu world, a dead Chopin, he turned to me and you know we've been looking and a lot of the customers that we have together um, actually work in air gapped environments. And when we work in air gapped environments, the situation is much more complex in Kubernetes. It is not an easy task to import in entire Helm charts into a air gapped environment. Um, there are tools that are trying to make this better and there's different approaches, um, but overall Kubernetes and air gapped is a difficult thing today. Um, and the Carvel packaging is probably the best tool in my opinion um, to actually deal with air gapped. So the way that I needed to approach this is he had asked me is, okay, this is great. We can do a Tanzu package install of any of the Bitnami Helm charts. That's awesome. But will this work in air gapped? Because we know that Carvel packages can be air gapped. And the answer is that like this, the answer is no. Because we're still pulling from the internet, the Helm chart, and we still haven't changed our image manifests, uh, our image references that are still going out to Docker Hub right now. Um, all we're doing is wrapping up the Helm chart in a very simple way. Um, this has its benefits, but we can do better. So the next approach that I took after doing this was let's see how we can actually make this better. And so here I have the Helm to Carvel conversion tool that I built. And this is 
packaged in a uh, bit of a different way. Um, if we take a look at how this is packaged, um, this is under github.com slash OS slash version tool, I believe. And here within this uh, specific repository, um, one of the things that we have is this readme that explains how this tool works. So this tool is not anymore just the Bitnami Helm charts. This is actually a tool that allows us to convert any Helm repository into a package repository that we could add to our cluster. So one of the things that I realized over time was that as I wanted to build these out, I wanted to automate the process. Um, there is a lot of stuff that we need to do. Um, automating the building of YAML files, converting JSON to YAML, uh, setting up open API v3 schemas, um, take a lot of tools. And I didn't want to build everything from scratch. I wanted to use tools that existed in the community. Um, but in order to do that, some of them use NPM. Some of them are Python based. Some of them are Go based. Um, and the amount of dependencies that this required for a developer after I wrote the script, the amount of things that someone needed, they needed JQ, they needed YQ. And for those that have used YQ before, know there are two YQs out there that are completely incompatible with one another. The developers, neither one is going to change and they're both just YQ. Um, so half the time when your YQ commands don't work that you follow, that you're following some blog, it's because you're using the wrong YQ. Um, but so you need that specific one. Uh, you need the readme generator from Mitnami, uh, Helm V3, JSON to YAML to convert JSON into YAML, KBuild an image package, the Helm schema gen plugin, all of these different things, which just became a huge mess to install. So. What I've done is actually created a Docker image um, that's pushed up. It's on a pub, on my public GHCR repo um, and mentioned here. And what we can actually do very simply, and we're going to do this right now, and then we'll go into the code and understand how this is working, is we can very simply run this alias command. Um, and this, by the way, works on WSL. It works on Mac OS. It works on Linux. It does not work on Windows like most things. Um, oh, it would help if I actually press copy. Um, hold on. What just happened? Alias command. One, yes. Okay, so we have our alias now. And now, one of the things I can do is a source to. Helm to package. Yeah, it's here actually mentioned. Helm to package dash dash bash completion. So I've even added bash completion to this. Um, this again running in a Docker container. But if we do this, now I can run Helm to package dash dash, and we actually have all of these different values that we can provide. So great. Do I want to add the Helm repository? What is the Helm repository's name and what is the Helm repository URL? Which, which, you, which repo do I want to use? Um, I could also do a dash dash help, for example, and get a full help menu here of what the mandatory flags are, what the optional flags are, and what they do. Um, we could set how many versions of a chart we want to package up. So in the examples we've seen till now, we only have one version. Hello. Um, Hey. You, thank you. You just didn't want to pop it on to have some ah. bigger. Thanks. Ah, awesome. Yeah. So we could set, you know, the number of versions that we want of charts. We could do all of these different things. So one of what I'll actually do here is by default, this is going to take the entire chart repository. So I would, let's say, add Bitnami, and this will download all 98 Helm charts from Bitnami and create a package repository for me. For the sake of time, uh, one of the things I added was you can actually pass a chart list file path. Um, you can create a file. So I've actually created one here. Um, if we do a C2 and to Tuesday, we can see here that I have this file called chart list. If I do a cat chart list, 
we can see I've added two charts here, WordPress and Argo CD. So these are the two charts that I want to use. Um, so what I'm going to run here is a Helm to package command. And the command is going to be Helm to package. I'm going to say, okay, I want two versions of my charts. And I want this push to my uh, registry of Harbor v. Rabbi Cloud into the repo pack demo. Um, the name of my package repository is also going to be called tack demo. And I want the suffix of the name of my packages to be Tanzu Tuesday. And I'm just going to pass it that chart list that I gave it. So we're going to run this. And this is running within a container, uh, within a Docker container. So all you need is Docker on your machine. Um, what just broke here? I love live demos. Uh, um, ba, 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 ba. Ah, hold on. Yeah, no, I broke this one second. Hope that this doesn't break now because I think that was my issue. Just one second. What is my issue here? Oh, hold on. I have a bad alias happening. You have to love live demos, they always work great. Digging the ASCII art as well. Yeah. Ah, the Tanzu Kubernetes Grid Admin Console. By Terraskai. Exactly. So whenever you, uh, you know, like do your art as a kid and then you just like really needed to sign the bottom corner. Yeah. Exactly. A little signature. Yeah. Good. Yeah, you get it love in the chat. Live demos are the best. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, they are they are a lot of fun until they go wrong, but that's the fun of them is if they go wrong. You know, I think like I just I've been in your position right now a lot, like as a presenter, right? The live demo is is certainly the the kind of like peak of fun for me, uh, and that exactly. scrambling, so, you know, for for exactly. solutions and situations. And so I actually like, know exactly what I did wrong. <laughs> I had exported the alias in the wrong folder, um, and there was no chart list there. Uh, there was no chart list txt file that I was mounting in. So here, when I'm generating the alias, I'm using pwd. Uh, so it was actually generating the alias on the wrong folder, um, which makes sense that that wouldn't work. Um, so now what we can see that's going to happen uh... is this is... I see. Yeah, one way to do that so that it would always be contextual uh, is to make sure that the PWD was um, within like square evaluates uh, as, a, as a shell, like escape it. Right. Yeah. 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 So, that's a bug that we should definitely fix there. Yeah, definitely. So, what we're doing here, so let's take a look at what happened. So, it's starting the script. And it's saying, okay, we're going to utilize the Helm repository at this URL. We're going to utilize, it's going to be named Bitnami. It realizes that that repo doesn't exist. So we're going to add it and it adds that repository. And then it, great, it ran its update. It updated my package repo, um, my Helm repository. And now it's saying the packages will be generating with the naming convention of the chart name dot Tanzu Tuesday, because I gave it that special uh chart suffix in my command and then it's going to use the supplied chart list so it's not going to do the default and that's only these two and it's going to get the last two versions and what we're seeing here this is actually the output for those that have used carvel before of kbuild kbuild right now is going and actually generating within my helm chart i see that there's a reference to docker io bitnami dex 233 debian 10 r2 
Well, this is the actual immutable reference to that image. That is the SHA to that image. Whoa. So I'm going to change this. We're basically traversing our Helm chart, understanding all the images that exist within it, and then creating a lock file. So saying, great, these are the actual images that are needed in order to deploy this Helm chart as it is defined at this specific moment. So, so Scott, you're saying that you could take somebody's Helm chart uh, and without having to rely on the stability of their tagging protocols and stuff, you could run it through Helm to package. Yep. And then, you know, it, it uses its contained set of dependencies to actually run K build. And then that locks that output of the Helm template. Exactly. And so right. And like these images, then they, they get locked to a specific shaw so then like i could yeah. use maybe some other carvel tools and like this is the air gap story you're talking about right exactly right wow. so i'm one of the things that becomes difficult is let's say when i built this originally for bitnami um bitnami are great and their helm charts have standards so you know exactly how an image is going to be referenced so if you're traversing over a values yaml of bitnami you know a that there is not going to be any hard-coded image URLs within the manifest themselves, it's all going to be in the values YAML. So that makes it easy there. The other thing that you know is exactly what fields you're looking for. You have a global repo registry tag, and then you also have for the specific components, registry repo tag. So you have three fields that always come together and you can very easily parse that through an automation. The issue is, is that there are Helm charts out there that do not work this way. There are people that hard code images all over the place or hard code the repository in the tag, but not the registry use or the registry. that use rotating tags, you know, you know, yeah. I decided internally, I don't believe in latest. I just decided that I'm going to use oldest because, <laughs> you know, no one's trying to hack the oldest version of something who's trying to hack like MS DOS today. Um, you know, low tech is the highest tech there is. Um, but yeah, so all my images have an oldest tag, uh, internally. Um, but so I, it becomes really difficult in those cases. And what, that's why when building this tool, we'll see in a second, when we look through the code that there are so many hacks that I'm doing and different manipulations in order to really find any image that could exist within this Helm chart. Um, so if we take a look here at, so this ran K build, awesome. It referenced all that. And then it's generating my package manifest for Argo CD version 305. Awesome. And now it's going and doing WordPress 13.0.12. It did that. It's generated the package manifest. And now it's doing the same thing for 13.0.13. So it's found the last two versions and it's generating that for WordPress as well. Once this has been generated, we then generate a package repository, which is basically a large package wrapping up our small package. Um, we can see that for four charts, it took a minute, 23 seconds to do all the K build and all of that stuff. Um, and it actually outputs for me two types of output. So the first one is if I wanted to add this to a Tanzu cluster, uh, I could run this very simple command. So let's actually run that right now in the back end as we go over the rest of it. And then we will continue to go over what's going on. So this is adding the package repository we just generated to my cluster. We could also use kubectl apply uh, if we wanted to. So if we weren't running with Tanzu CLI or anything like that, and you had cap controller installed, you could run this command as well. And we actually export to you the uh, manifest of the repo. And then if you wanted to do air gap, well, so we have three or four simple steps. Number one is we're going to run an image package copy of this bundle that was pushed up to our registry to a tar file. So I'm going to create a tar file right now of my repository. And when I run this right now, what's going to happen is we'll see in one second is that this is actually going to go and copy down that repository but as you saw we had all of the image references with kbuild 
an image package, because this is now a full package using image package in the back end in KBuild, we can see here, great. When I go to copy this to a tar, that tar is going to export and import into it all of these packages and then all of these images from Docker Hub. So it's going to download them all right now, going to create a single tar for me, a single image package tar that we can import into our environment. We can copy that however we need into our error gapped environment. And all we need to do then is image package copy that tar to your repository, wherever that is, probably a harbor, or a factory, or Nexus, or whatever. You push it up to there, and then add the repo to your cluster as per the instructions above, just changing the URL. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty new to, to the scene. And so one question I'm wondering is, um, how was this done before these tools existed? How would you have made yeah. this? So the way this would have been done in the past is depending really on how your Helm chart looks like. So let's say that I went here and let's actually do a Helm pull of, uh, let's say, pack demo slash WordPress. So let's pull this down and do an output. So we're just going to pull down this uh, repository for us and then we'll go into WordPress. So this is my Helm repository. Okay. Uh, what I would look to is I would say, okay, we're using Bitnami, so we know that they're standardized. So let's look at our values YAML. And I'm going to look here, and I'm going to find anywhere that we have a registry. So, ah, here I've got a registry. Great. Okay. Let's copy this down. Uh, let's go down. More, 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 more. Let's say here, let's look for registry. Ah, we've got another one there. And then we've got another one there. And then we've got another one here we would have to go and traverse find all these images you uh -huh. would then go and do a docker pull you would do a docker save to a tar so you would go and do a docker pull let's say whatever engine x you know you found your image you pulled it down um everything is great i've got my local docker image now and you would have done second. all this manually or you would have automated it somehow but yeah you okay but usually you would do this somehow it's you know there was no real tooling around this okay. you would go and pull down these images you uh -huh. you know basically bring them out from your docker demon into atari you do a docker docker uh export um mm -hmm. you would export that to atar you would have 30 tar files you would import those into your environment oh. you would load them into a docker demon and push those into your registry and then you would go and take this WordPress here, and you would edit the values YAML. Uh -huh. Values .yaml, you'd edit this. And if you weren't using Bitnami, which has this ability to actually like override everywhere the image registry you're using, uh -huh. um, with most Helm charts, you'd come and say, ooh, OK, so here is this one. Let's change this to harbor.vrabbi.cloud. And then let's change this here to where it's pushed in my environment. So that's going to be library. And then so you'd be making all of these changes manually within your values file. Uh -huh. Take this Helm chart, bring it into your environment. Now, what's the issue with this? Beyond the fact that there's so much manual work and a lot of steps happening, is that how do I stay in line now with upstream? So tomorrow, Bitnami release a new version of the Helm chart. I have uh -huh. to do that again. I have to do that every week that a new Helm chart version comes out. Or I, the maintenance of this becomes very difficult. And that's really where the challenge is. So there are certain tools that are trying to help here. Um, one of the tools, uh, if we stay just in the native uh, Helm world, is actually called Relocates. Um, Okay. So if we look at relocates, this asset relocation tool for Kubernetes um, is another tool that uh, is was recently released by VMware that allows us basically to do this, but it's at the single chart level. So I give it the tar GZ or the, you know, however I want to give it the, you know, untarred folder of my Helm chart, um, mm -hmm. but I can do relocates chart move this. But in this case, also, I need to give it an image patterns file. So what does that actually mean? Um, and I tell it 
to which registry to push. But what does that actually mean, a image hints file? Well, if I look here at this dot relocates file, um, this is what it looks like. So this makes it a lot easier. What are we doing? We're saying, great, this is where within my Helm chart, these are the paths. So at dot image registry and then mm -hmm. slash dot image repository colon mm -hmm. image tag. So that's how that image is defined. Okay. And this is how my that is defined, right? I'm not giving any hard coding here of what those values are. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you what the build out is of my chart. So this would be the yeah. chart author writing this. Okay. And then you could pass this into relocates for a okay. single chart mm -hmm. and it will do this type of thing for you. Got it. But it's still at the single chart level and I need to have this metadata created. What if the uh -huh. author of the chart didn't create this? Yeah. And how That's many charts are we talking about too, generally? I mean, you know, that's really a good question. Um, you know, I've seen organizations that have Helm charts, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Helm charts. Um, okay. And, you know, one of the things that people want to be able to do is have a cube apps internally. They want to have that just chart. They want to have an awesome catalog of great. These are all the apps you yeah. can deploy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. When you're in air gap, usually what it is, is only if something is needed, will it be yeah. imported because otherwise it's such a mess to deal with it here very easily. I could take an entire repo and do that. Right. Cool. So as we see here, this was just added and, you know, we just mentioned a UI and cube apps. So let's actually look at cube apps. Last time I had mentioned that cube apps has, you know, some experimental support for Carvel. Well, it's gotten even better since. Um, so this is the newer version. Um, and welcome to my Carvel packages in cube apps. Um, so this picks up all the packages in my environment and we can see here, these are the ones that come from TKG out of the box. Um, and then I also have my Argo CD and my WordPress one. So let's take a look at WordPress. If I look at WordPress here, we can see that we give it a description. It's just the Bitnami WordPress Helm chart. This is auto generated. And then we have here the release notes. WordPress is the world's most popular blogging and content management platform, powerful yet simple, please, yada, yada. Please, Scott. Thank you. Yep. So how was this actually generated, these release notes? Well, we're actually just taking this data from the Helm chart itself, from values that exist in the chart.yaml. So we're generating here all of the data that we need. And then let's say that I wanted to go and deploy this. So how do I actually go and deploy a Carvel package? So here we go. I get a UI here with all of the values with the default values rendered for me, but they're all commented out. And the reason that they're commented out is that there's an approach that comes from Carvel where one of the issues in Helm charts overall um, is that because Helm charts only have this idea of templating where you have to give it a value, a basically you need to expose a value for anything that gets uh, configured, that's configurable. We end up basically having this huge API service for WordPress itself. We have 297 different fields that can be set. That is a huge number of values. And 90% of these are things that no one is going to change on a day-to-day -day basis. But there are things that there is the edge use case where you need this, or there's the edge use case where you need to configure this. And Carvel, on the other hand, because Carvel has this idea of we can template and we can also overlay, we can use kind of like the customize method of overlaying, we come under the idea within Carvel that you shouldn't have such a large values YAML. But when we're bringing in a Helm chart, we can't just, I can't decide in a tool like this, which values should be exposed to you, which ones aren't. Um, so what we do instead here within cube apps is that all of these values are just commented out. So if you don't give it a values YAML, it takes the defaults. If we want to expose something, so let's say I want to deploy WordPress here. I want to set my WordPress password to VMware one exclamation point. And I want to come here and say that my username is not going to be user. It's going to be Scott. And our blog name, let's say, is going to be 
let's say can do Tuesday is awesome. So that's what we're going to change here. And I'm going to say which which service account this is supposed to run. And I'm going to give it a name, just like we would give a Helm release its name. So I'm going to call this demo. And let's deploy it. So this is going right now and deploying my application for me into my cluster. So we can see here, it still hasn't found any workloads. Slowly, it's starting to find the objects themselves that are being managed as this package is being reconciled. So we can see here, for example, our secrets. Uh, one of the nice things in Cube Apps, for example, is you could come here and actually view like the secret, or you could copy it to your clipboard. Um, so everything that we get with our Helm charts, right? So we get all of this visibility. We can see here what our installation values were that we had configured. Um, if I go back to applications now, we can see that it's in the reconciling state. So our package is being deployed right now. Uh, we can come back into here and we can actually see the output of cap controller. So I can see here exactly what's going on. I can see where it is in its process. So I can see that it's waiting on one replica to be ready. It's waiting on the pod for Maria DB. This is waiting also on the persistent volume claim of MariaDB, right? We can see exactly what is going on, what is planned to be deployed, and also what is currently being deployed in all of these cases. And as we see, where did it fetch from? It fetched from my repo where we had pushed automatically using the tool, our manifests. Now we can see that we've got a deployment. We have a stateful set. We've got secrets, services, other resources as well, all of these different objects. Um, my deployment still isn't ready yet, but we do have our load balancer address. And up here, we actually get this click. Let's see if WordPress is up yet. So if I come here and do a k get yo dash n pkp packages, say, so we're up and running now. And if we come back to this and try to access, there we go. Tanzu Tuesday is awesome with our WordPress application deployed automatically. Now, what's so strong about this, though, because we're using Helm, and I deployed that through the UI, but what if I came here and did a Tanzu package install list? I want to see what packages I have installed in my cluster. Well, there you go. I have WordPress installed. So I could look at this from the CLI perspective. I could create my package from the CLI and view it in the UI. I could create one from the UI and see it here in the CLI. Um, so everything here is completely configurable from different levels of the stack. I could come and do this from the CLI here using Tanzu. I could do a K get PKGI. Cache and PKG packages. Are you zooming, and, please? Yep. Thank you. And if I do that, we can see here also that I have my package, right? So we have all of these different ways of interacting with it, and CubeApps is now giving us this UI, just like it does for Helm charts for our packages themselves. And now that my package here, as we had finished it, was actually pulled down and exists now locally, I have a tar. If we go back to that and I do a CD slash PMP, we have here this my repo.tar. This is my air gap bundle. If we go back to the air gap idea. And now that I have this tar, how do I actually go and import this into my environment? So if we go back up, we can see here the output. What were we supposed to do? So we did our air gapped instructions. I ran the copy. I've copied this into my air gapped environment. And how do I actually push this? So let's actually push it right now. So I'm going to run an image package copy of that file to say harbor.vrabbi.cloud slash. And let's bring up my harbor here. Let's find, let's create a new repo just so that you see that I'm actually doing everything from scratch here. Let's log in. Let's create a new project here. Let's call this Kanzu Tuesday. Make it public for now. So we have this new Tanzu Tuesday empty repo. 
and I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to push this to Tamzu Tuesday slash package repo, let's say, version 0 0.1.0. Uh, I'm not going to attack you. We're just going to push it like that. Um, and then I'm going to tell it to, um, I don't remember the flag here. It's registry verify certs false, I think, just because I'm using a self-signed cert. Um, so we're going to pass it that. And what this is going to do, we see it's importing 24 images right now into my repository, into my registry. So all I did was ran a single command outside, did that copying to a tar file, copy that into my air gapped environment, and am now going and importing this into my actual uh, local environment to my harbor. So what we see here is that we're getting okay, what our status is, and we can see it's done on floating the images. And if I come here, do a refresh, harbor, we can see here we've got all of our artifacts within our registry pushed and ready for us to utilize. So one of the things that I could do is I'm going to change here to QTTX to, let's say, a different cluster. Uh, this cluster. Um, so here, if I did a uh, K get PKPR, which is package repositories, we're going to look. And I only have the standard Tanzu ones. I don't have my custom one. And what we're going to do is now just add this package repository. So as we mentioned here, just use the instructions from above. Just change the URL, obviously, with your correct URL. So I'm actually just going to copy the SHA because it's always the same, um, just to not need to look for it. And I'm going to do a Tanzu package repository, add, and let's call this PT for Tanzu Tuesday, because I don't feel like typing a long line. Um, and then we're going to give it the dash dash URL, and that's going to be harbor.vrabbi.cloud slash Tanzu Tuesday slash uh, package repo. that shot into the namespace tend to package repo global so that's all we need to do this is going to add my package repository now it's going to sync the package repository to the cluster and then i'm going to go and install wordpress into this cluster but we'll do it from the cli and what we'll see and this is the really strong thing is that if i come here again and do a k get go or actually, we can probably view this from QBAPS itself. If I come back to QBAPS, which is here, um, one of the things that we should be able to see, if I come to my deployments, I know you actually can't see it, um, is that these are actually still running from Docker Hub, right? Just because we're using a Carvel package is we are still coming from Docker Hub. So if I go to my Tanzu Tuesday, dash N, PKG packages, and let's just take demo MariaDB, bash OEML, and let's grab for image. We can see here that I'm pulling from image Docker IO with the SHA. So I'm still pulling from the internet, but because I'm using Carvel packaging, automatically I get this lock that's locking me in to the SHA. So no matter what, I'm getting this immutability. But if we come and look here now, so my package repository has been added to my other cluster. If I did a Tanzu package available list, what we'll be able to see here is that we've got WordPress.Tanzu Tuesday. So let's go and do here a Tanzu package install, uh, let's call it WP. Uh, and then we're going to do here dash P. So which package? It's going to be WordPress Tanzu Tuesday. I'm going to say the version that I want is going to be 13.0.12, actually, the older version that I have um, because we imported two versions. So I'm going to import that here. And then I'm going to also give it, no, we're not going to give it any values. We're just going to use the default values. 
and we're going to run this and this is going to install our package for us and install wordpress so if i came here now and did a k get video we can see that we've got these pods that are starting to come up so let's look at what wordpress maria db just like we looked at in the previous one but we're going to look at this at dash o yaml and we're going to do a prep to the image and in this case, I'm pulling the image from Harbor v. Rabbi Cloud Tanzu Tuesday package repo at this shot. So all of our images have been imported automatically into our environment through that single shot. And automatically we get this full manageability that we can do in an air gapped environment. Through very simple commands, I could take the entire Bitnami Helm repository. Um, it takes about 45 minutes to bundle up as a tar. Um, it's huge. Um, but we create that tar file, import it into the environment, push it up to your repo, and immediately through either the CLI or the UI or whatever we want, we have this ability now to actually manage our applications in a really elegant way. And we can use Helm charts or YTT or GitOps or any of these different approaches we can use the same tooling, the same CLI, the same UI to get this across the board, um, which I think is a really big change. Um, and yeah, let's see, were there any questions in the chat? Doesn't look like it. Okay. So yeah, and I think that this is, you know, one of the really cool things um, around Carvel packaging. Um, all right, we have a question here from Robert of, do you think we will see more air gap type deployment image management as the general need for supply chain lockdown increases? Uh, the answer is yes. I think we will see more. We're seeing that with relocates now. Uh, we're seeing that with Carvel, but it's not an easy task to solve. Um, and even image package itself i can you know share here one of the issues that exists with image package i would say right now um with how it's implemented is if i come and open this up and let's look at my harbor so i imported a package repository that has two wordpress and one and two argo cd charts um here can you tell me which of these images lee is for uh wordpress no that you, you really can't tell. And I, I wonder if any of the original image metadata maybe is labeled on the image would be smart. So it is, it is, it is. Um, right? So some of these things you can still get. So this one specifically, you can't because that's not an image itself. But um, if I came here and found one that's actually a bit bigger. So let's say- but it's terrible like to browse, one. right? Yeah. Exactly. So I would like almost I came want here... a namespacing rule, right? Like I would want to create a, a section of my registry namespace where all of the original names kind of get chopped off and then you know preserved. Exactly. Um, right. So you can see here, right? I've got all of the build history still, right? So I know exactly what was run. I can see the labels that were added. I right. You still oh, have all of this. Yeah, but what's the name of the image? Is that there? Uh yeah, the name of the image is Sha minus the Sha of the image dot image package. Yeah, no, but like, you know how you were like, if it's a, yeah. if it's a WordPress or a Maria nope. DB thing, right? Like, I would kind of hope that image package exactly. copy would like tack that on there or something. But right. So currently, the answer is, is it doesn't, yeah, right? It, it might affect the SHA. Exactly, right? Yeah. So you can't change the SHA here. Um, because yeah. we want to make sure that we're uh, copying the same image. So yeah, I'd, I'd we, really like to see this behavior be configurable in image package copy uh, to have it's, some. So it's going tools. to. Okay. There, there are some issues open on this. There's actually a proposal open as well um, to try and make it actually configurable that you could set, for example, rules of like, hey, just change the registry to this, but we want to keep the same structure of repositories and you know the folders along the way right all the subpaths or replace this subpath with this subpath or mm -hmm. you know to be able to kind of template it out how we would want things to work um but it's still in its early stages because yeah something like that is not easy and you have to get it right um it's, it's hard to do it from um from a automation perspective but it certainly would be you know you can see why if you were building this tool from the programming perspective 
like you would just shove everything into the same repository namespace because then you're like guaranteed that you're not stepping over anybody in the repo and that kind of stuff. Um, but and it's yeah. not only that. It's not only that. It's let's say that I had an application from Bitnami that was, you know, Docker IO slash Bitnami slash node. And then you also had Docker IO slash node from the Docker IO, you know, main mm. repository. And yes. you also had one from, from GCR. And I go and now import those all into my environment. Well, they're all going to be just node with different shots, but they're all going to, are they going to overwrite each other? Yeah. Image you need like package. a go path thing, you know, a go path right. style namespacing, like happening within the subdirectories of your, uh, your registry, which exactly. is not, you know, a, a bad way about going about things, but you, you end up with these really long image names. And um, at the it end of the day, very though, difficult, it's like, it's, it, this is a hard problem to program for but it's very clear that the experience of the operator uh, whether you are a registry operator or an application debugger inside of the cluster it's like you see this thing and it's like oh great it's some random sha from the package right. repo like that's exactly you know, yeah totally right, so, hear what you're saying so that's definitely a challenge here right and there's no question that there are challenges with this this approach of image package that's why i like image package though within the context of a package repository because a package repository is, again, all I'm trying to do is bring from place A into place B and make it easy to install. When you need to go, if you were just using image package, bring it into my environment, and now I need to write my own kubectl manifest. I need to write my own Kubernetes YAML manifest, and I need to figure out which shy it is. I couldn't deal with it. But when we're dealing with it in packages, in the end, I don't care what the image is. That's the nice thing, because I don't need to. All I need to care about is the fact that I gave my intent in the values file, and it was generated for me. And it's running, and it's being reconciled, and everything is great. Right? So there's complexities of this. And I think that using the packaging APIs kind of wraps those issues up, though, and makes them much more uh, consumable uh, and much more palatable rather than if you were using like Kubernetes manifest directly and then, you know, needing to figure out what the image is within my manifest becomes a bit more difficult. Yeah, I'm trying to, to kind of, um, you know, there's always this pattern that you see when you need to glue things and transport things. Um, and with an air gap registry, like you don't have the ability to nat out, you know, and like talk to the internet. Um, you know, maybe like more of a mirror type registry. Right. Uh, but, it, but it does make me wonder, it's like, okay, well, you, you get that laptop or that USB stick or whatever gets that tarball into that environment. But um, I wonder if there is maybe a different experience here with mirroring happening within the registry that could be maybe more similar to like forking a Git repository, you know? Um, yeah. So when you fork a repo, you can, of course, you know, get your laptop, pull it from somewhere and push it somewhere else. But a lot of these Git platforms um, that, you know, would be analogous to Harbor, um, they have like the ability to go and do that and to sync from the upstream fork into, right. you know, and the sort of tooling that you've built here with Helm to PKG um, is kind of filling in that problem, but then run, you know, from laptops or from a CI job or that kind of thing. And, uh, it'd be interesting to see, like, as this space gets more mature, like what Robert is referring to, uh, what yeah. sort of features get built into these registry management tools. Exactly. I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see, uh, you know, how that's going to work, because I think that AirGap is going to be very interesting. I think we will see a lot of changes here, um, especially coming from places like VMware, um, just because in the end, most people that are running in public clouds um, have some level of internet access. Um, those that are running on premise, those that are dealing with, uh, you know, Kubernetes on prem, and I think we're going to see it also from the Amazons and Googles out there with Anthos and EKS Anywhere, and and from Rancher, and I think we're going to see it from all or Suze, I guess now who own Rancher, but we're mm -hmm. going to see it from all these different organizations that are really focusing now on the enterprise Kubernetes. As enterprises are moving into Kubernetes in these, you know, more lockdown industries that weren't dealing with Kubernetes till now. 
Um, and they're starting to deal with Kubernetes and they have these air gap scenarios. Um, we're gonna start to see more tooling here. Um, part of it is because of the idea of a secure supply chain like Robert mentioned. I think part of it is just the fact of which industries are now adopting Kubernetes, which happen to be industries that also have, you know, some air gap environments. Um, and I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens. Um, and it's really great to see Carvel as one of these tools that's already doing it. Um, there are things that could be better, right? There are things that will get better. There are things that are being worked on. Um, but Carvel already has all the tools that let us do this. Um, and yeah, one thing I really, strong. really like about the Carvel tool set is that since it's divided up into individual pipeable tools, um, the problems that the individual's tools solve, they're so clear, like they're not muddying the water or like bringing other things into the context of solving this particular problem, you know, like, um, I think that that's always been one of the issues that I've had with Helm is that it's kind of a one stop shop for you to solve a bunch of things in the same domain. Um, right. But then you get this sort of abstraction leakage, you know, like where are the images coming from? You know, and with the approach on templating, it's like, how do you get your own values into this thing that actually doesn't have any structure underneath because of the programming model? You know, and right. so you get these sharper tools um, as we kind of come into this next generation of problem solving. You know, it's like, of course, we have entire ecosystems of people building applications around Helm, but, you know, it's, YTT isn't the first tool to come in here and say, hey, maybe that way actually kind of sucks, you know, the specific, the templating part, right? Not, right. The, not the values abstraction, probably the best part of Helm, right? But yeah. the templating part, oh, you know, can we modularize a little bit? Can we pipe some other things in here and break up the problem so that you can get specific about how you want to solve it? And um, I think... I, I love what you were saying as well about the air gap networks and about how that's so important um, using these tools and this packaging approach, but kind of to uh, the security sensitive part of this question as well is it's actually almost more important to be using these, the benefits and then to be solving for the benefits that Carvel packaging gives you in an environment where you have internet access. Uh, because as we've seen kind of dependency sprawl through the ecosystem, um, it's a, you know, a very well-known supply chain attack vector uh, to, you know, get control of an image repository and then start changing things out underneath it without the tag changing, you know, um, and that happens, you know, on the, on the NPM registry, it happens, you know, where, when we build our programs and now it can happen with our critical infrastructure as more and more people start to, adopt Helm charts and deploy them everywhere. And so if you were, you know, say, sealing up these Helm charts, you get a promise, you know, that when you lock those images and that you've moved them over into your registry, that they're not changing. Uh, and that's, it's almost more important, you know, if if your cluster has the ability to to go and pull whatever it, you, know, you want off of the internet to be able to pin those things. Uh, so you're yeah. getting this about something that's pretty unique. And, um, actually, an awesome thing here um, from Michael Nelson, actually, is one of the maintainers of uh, Cube Apps. Um, that originally, when we were the when they were looking through, you know, the integration with Carvel and at what level to do the integration with one of the tools or with the packages or with the apps, or at which level of the abstraction, um, he actually created this one that talks exactly to what you were talking about of using actually KBuild as a Helm post renderer. So Helm has this idea of a post renderer that you can use, that you can plug something in. Um, and KBuild really gives us that extra level of security of like locking it down to that specific image SHA. Um, and so one of the things we could actually do is a Helm install cube apps, let's say, names is it, and give it the KBuild post renderer. And this will actually convert everything into the SHA in our manifests as Helm goes and deploys it. Right. So like even with Helm, we could do these things if we wanted to. And that's what's so great about Carvel. They work great together. All of the Carvel tool set going from Vendir into, you know, Im to, into image package and YTT and cap and everything works great together. But you want to use Helm? Great. That doesn't mean that KBuild doesn't have its place. That doesn't mean 
that image package doesn't or that any of these tools, you can use them modularly to whatever your benefit is, to whatever your specific use case is. Um, and it doesn't need to be a one take it or leave it for the entire suite. You could mix it up uh, with your existing tooling. Right. And yeah, and using this was, YTT and as a post render, you know, that's just exactly it's just a masterful level of control over. I mean, like I almost would be less interested in using so many of the chart values, you know, because I can just write a YTT patch that, you know, does the kinds of things that maybe you might otherwise rely on a mutating admission controller or something. You know, I can put that right into a YTT patch and have it all be uh, statically asserted before the stuff actually ever touches my API server. Exactly. And I, I think one of the best examples of that was actually today, I was working on a project for a customer where we're working on some, you know, logging mechanisms for Kubernetes and uh, basing it off the ELK stack. And as we were looking at this, you know, there actually is a bug in the Bitnami Elasticsearch um, Helm chart where because Helm charts are using Go templating, it, they are so, there are, I, I think it's over 890 values for the Elasticsearch Helm chart. Um, there is a bug in there that if you turned on the XPAC security feature, so you wanted security for Elasticsearch, um, Ingress can't work because they were not rendering the port name correctly between the service and the Ingress because they're completely different files based off of other values that were added in later on and it wasn't being rendered mm -hmm. with something like ytt as a post renderer you could very simply just write an overlay to fix that issue um and not need to wait for the new release of a chart and for the pr and I'll, obviously prs are important i have one in the making right now to fix this issue um mm -hmm. but but you still. have that ability to break glass Exactly. Right. It's like because what happens when the if it abstraction isn't fails you as the infrastructure engineer? You're always like, okay, well, you know, let me just get in there and patch some stuff in. Exactly, and that I can do with Carvel. Carvel allows me to do that in such an easy way. A very powerful um, and expressive way. I I definitely agree. My personal opinion is that I very much like authoring things in YTT instead of customize. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's for sure, I think. Uh, the only thing that I prefer about, about customize is that I can do a kubectl apply-k. Um, the fact that it was in, that it was integrated into kubectl uh, is the only benefit I think that customize has over YTT. Only sometimes though, because depending- Depending on, on the version. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Recently, it's been updated. I think, what was it, 1.20 or 1.21 that they updated the version of uh, Customize, like 13 versions ahead a, of where it was before? As a Kubernetes contributor, I was very vehemently opposed to this addition to KubeCuddle. Um, yes. And we, we even I, removed it for a release and then had to put it back. Um, right. It was, I was not very pleased with, um, yeah. with having this very new tool. You know, I... I love Phil. Phil is cool, um, but uh, I didn't think that customize should have been included into the the upstream um, command line tool when there were many other uh, tools that had already had such a rich history uh, around solving this problem. And, uh, it's what I we got the, now, though. So yeah, <laughs> I think the one other thing that's you know interesting with packaging, just to look at you know one last thing is actually we had talked in the last Tanzu Tuesday about Tanzu application platform and I mentioned this TAP OSS, this open source TAP that I had built out. And this is, I think, a very good example of what packages, how you actually could go about building packages, not using the Helm approach. If I needed to deploy an application, how do I actually go about doing that? And one of the really cool things that I've done here is if we look at the TAP install package itself, what we can see here, and this is what's really cool, because this we haven't shown yet, is that if I do here, let's do a bad, I'm going to make this screen bigger in one second, don't worry. And what we're going to do here is actually look at the, let's say, what's an interesting one here? Let's say, let's say the cartographer. Why not? So one of the things that we're doing here is we're simply creating a package install. When I did a Tanzu package installer, I installed from CubeApps. 
that's creating a C that's creating a CR in my cluster, a custom resource called package install with a reference to the package. And if we had values, it would be values. Um, so this is a package that is actually installing multiple packages. And what we've done here is simply said, okay, if I have an array of disabled packages, by default, I install all of the platform. If cartographer tap OSS exists within that and within that array, install equals false. Otherwise, by default, it's set to true. And then if install equals true, great, let's install this package. Very easy to understand. And the benefit here is that this is all above my actual manifest. My manifest itself, I haven't changed anything in here. This is, yeah, this is a YAML. valid YAML file. Exactly. Everything all, here is all of the YTT valid. bits that you can enable your editor, you know, highlighter for. Like it's it's all actually sitting in these special pound at comments. Exactly. And if we look here, and I we can't get into all the depths of this, but one of the really cool things with CAP is this idea of ordering. With kubectl apply, one of the biggest issues that you have is that if you have let's say a CRD, and then you wanted to also apply the custom resource of that type of the CRD you created, or you have different things, it doesn't know how to do ordering. It applies and things will fail and you'll apply again and it will succeed um, because there's no ordering. And if the API server doesn't know that resource yet, then it's not gonna work. Um, one of the great things that we have within CAP controller, when we're using CAP, when we're using the packaging, is we get this idea of annotations that I can add of great. I'm gonna add this to a group called cartographer. This resource itself is now part of a group that I'm naming cartographer. And then I'm saying, great, I wanna change rules. So when a change is gonna happen, a create, an update, a deploy, anything that's going to change some state within my cluster for this object, then I just give it a name here and say, what do I wanna happen? I want it to upsert this resource after upserting cert manager a different change group name that I've configured on cert manager. And here I have for service account delete before deleting the service account. And we can actually That's set everything up problem. here. Yeah, that the deleting yeah. before the service account thing. It's right. Like everyone can install something in Kubernetes, but if you want a really hard problem, try uninstalling something. Exactly. But first delete the service account and then try to delete stuff. It's a lot of fun, right? Um, yeah, that'll that'll get you really quickly into a scenario where your namespace is just pending and there's a bunch of finalizers everywhere. And exactly. Controllers are throwing up because they don't have the permission to go and delete stuff in the API server anymore. It's just a, it's just a bad time. It's a mess. It's a mess, <laughs> right? And what this allows me to do, though, is install an entire platform, right? So this platform of tap, again, it's things like, Cert Manager, Contour, Knative, Cartographer, KPAC, Cert Injection, Webhooks, all of these different packages. Uh, currently, I think it's 14 packages that I'm installing within this. All of these different packages need to come up in a specific order. When you deploy something, when you have these large systems, there's orders of what components come up first. I need Cert Manager so that something else can generate certificates. Uh, I need contours so that something else can create an ingress object and that gets realized, right? We have these dependencies also between applications. And one of the cool things within this packaging and overall within Carvel, because this is just a cap feature, is that we can set these change groups. We can set these change rules. Um, and that really is where all this comes from and where the strength comes in. Now, I see that Carlos asked the question of, did I miss it? What does K14S stand for? So K14S is the original name for Carvel. Um, and that's Kubernetes tools. There is 14 characters between the K and S. Like there's eight characters between K and S for Kubernetes. Uh, so that's the original naming was the K14S tool set uh, and then was renamed to Carvel. Uh, no, there's actually a space in the Kubernetes tools. If you look at it, Kubernetes space tools and the space counts as a character for 14. I did that math once. Um, exactly. But uh, yeah, no, I like the name K14S also, but I think the last repo.
from uh, Carvel just changed their Go their Go uh, libraries to Carvel from K14S. Uh, I think the last one was today with YTT version 40, 040. Um, that just did that change, right? But these types of changes become so easy to do. Um, if I went and looked here at like Knative, we can see here that I'm actually doing a lot of other things. Um, and we're setting here again. So this is going to be upsert after Contour because Knative is using Contour in my case. Um, and we're setting different overlays and we're setting different things like that. And then we have parameterized secrets with my values. So this is my values YAML that you would supply if you wanted to give me a values file. And I'm just saying, great, if the domain type is NIP.io, that's what I'm supposed to set here. If it's SSLIP, that's how I'm supposed to set it. If it's you know real, then whatever you gave me, I'm gonna traverse that YAML and actually just give that YAML as the value here. So we're making it easier for the developer for certain use cases. And then for other ones, we're letting them still use that real, great, just give me your values YAML and I'll apply that here. Right, so we have all these different options of ifs and all this stuff that isn't go templating yuck within my YAML that makes it not valid YAML and very difficult to understand. Yeah, um, nothing that's indent sensitive anymore. You know, you exactly. Don't have, you don't have a helper to to take a string and then YAML encode right. and it and then include like, helpers dot tpl then, module at this line. Yeah. And then um, you're looking up the uh, you know the standard library for the thing and trying to figure out how you can and then also just the the postfix syntax of the function calls. Yeah. Exactly. And anyone, by the way, that wants to try this out and see like how I'm actually using packaging in a bash script, right? So packaging doesn't solve the bash magic, right? It makes it easier, there's less of it, but it still exists. Um, one of the really cool things here, again, just talking Tanzu, um, is that within this tap OSS uh, package repo that I've created, um, there's actually a new addition uh, since the time that we had uh, done the Tanzu Tuesday, um, where you can see here actually in scripts, we have this idea of a local environment. Um, and all you need to have is TCE on managed clusters, like 10, version 10 installed, uh, just the CLI. Um, and then if you have Docker desktop, you can run this single command and this will deploy a kind cluster, bind everything, install Knative, install all of the packages into an unmanaged cluster, and then also expose it onto your machine through NIP.io so that you can actually access all the ingresses, everything um, automatically using the Carvel tooling as the mechanism for how to deploy this all. So Carlos, that is in question. What about sequencing on a condition waiting for a resource? Do you have a certain condition before applying install the next resource? Yep, that is 100% possible to do. So what we can do in that case is if we actually look here um, at the Carvel docs um, and we come back here and this is actually gonna be in the cap documentation itself. Um, and if we look here at the docs of cap, uh, one of the things we can do is this, uh, you know, apply ordering that exists. And this is where they explain, you know, the idea of a change group and the change rules and how all of that works. Um, the other thing that we can do, um, for example, so here is examples of like that being used. Um, but there's also the ability to create a config file. Um, and I believe that's here. Um, and then we have this idea of a wait rule. So by default, CAP knows about default Kubernetes object. So it knows how to tell when a deployment is in the ready state, right? It knows when it, all of its replicas are ready. It knows when a stateful set is ready. It knows when a service of type load balancer has an IP address, right? There are things that are default, but then we have CRDs. We have all these different things. Um, so one of the things that we can say here is, okay, I could set wait rules for a custom resource. And the great thing here is that this gets configured in a YAML alongside your application code. So alongside your deployment YAML, you have a cap config YAML. And as long as it's there, it recognizes the API version. It looks like a CRD 100%, but the CRD doesn't exist in Kubernetes because when cap 
sees this, it analyzes it, learns what it's supposed to do, and then discards the file. So it's never applied to your cluster. This is just supplying configuration in a very straightforward and simple manner. So you could set here, great, I want weight rules. I want the condition matcher to be a type failed status true, and that's a failure. And otherwise the type is deployed. So the condition of deployed and the status is true means that it's successful, right? We have a success or failure from CAP's perspective. What is the actual type of the condition and what's the status of that condition? And then we have resource matchers. So here we have API version kind matcher. You could do it with names. You could do all these different types of matchers that we have. API version kind is the most common one. Um, but we could do different. We could say any matcher of any of these, or we could say all matchers from an array. So we have all of these different ways of setting up these rules, say exactly what I want to wait for. Yeah, you could even do something really weird here. Again, like in the infrastructure engineering use case where you are presented with something that sucks and you are not a tool developer, you're not a tool maintainer, you're not a chart maintainer, uh, but say like you get into a situation where you create an ingress and then you want to apply something that fixes the fact that your AWS ingress has a weird condition. You could totally write a wait rule here that actually matches for the failed custom condition from that AWS controller on the ingress resource calls that a success, applies something that fixes it, and then waits on that. You know, it's like you, right. you're just, you're given power, right? Like you exactly. do what you need. And I really like that about this. Right, we could match resources that have specific annotations for a wait rule, right? So I could say this wait rule applies for deployments that are only with this annotation because I add an annotation, this is broken um or whatever and then based off of that annotation i change my weight rules right or whatever it ends up being or on specific namespaces or if there's a non-empty namespace or if there is a namespace or how we would do these things we can really easily uh configure things um yeah. there's a small question here from vitale thomas uh, saying can we use that feature uh, to wait for a job to be executed i think the answer here is for that sure you don't need to Right. But you can. Yes. Right. If you wanted, if you were creating a job object, you could wait for the condition of succeeded. But because there is a condition already on the job. How to do this just out of the box. I'm not sure if for jobs it does. I think it does. But if it didn't have for jobs, then you could as well. Um, for they don't have for all of the resources, right? They have for a lot of them. Um, but you can see here, this is what the YAML looks like. You could save it in a config map and then use it, or you could just pass this file in as a YAML file. Um, and we can see API version, kind is config, and then our rebase rules, you could have, I mean, you have all these different types of things. There's not just the ability to set, like we were talking about before of like weight rules, you have this idea of a rebase rule, um, which allows us to explicitly define how to merge resources during an update, how to actually go and do these, you know, merge diffs. Uh, within Kubernetes, which are always an interesting way of doing things, um, but ownership label rules. So how could we actually add, you know, ownership labels, uh, label scoping rules and template rules and additional labels that we want to add to things um, and diffing against last applied field exclusion rules. So when you're actually going against the last applied, which is the worst field ever because it just blows up the size of your resource and then etcd doesn't like you anymore, um, but the last applied field annotation, so we can actually go based off of that and, you know, do different resource matching um, and mask rules. So this really gives us so many capabilities. Yeah, uh, I'll take this next question just uh, really quickly here, which yeah. is, um, can this config be in Git and then applied with Flux or Argo CD? And I think um, that the answer here uh, is that if you want cap, to be involved in deploying the thing and following all of your rules, because this is something that has to happen kind of in the runtime of the thing that applies your manifest. So um, Argo CD has a controller for that. Custo or a customized controller is the thing inside of Flux that does that. 
Um, you don't need to use the CAP CLI. Uh, you use a piece of software called CAP Controller that is responsible and has been kind of behind the scenes throughout the entire demo that Scott's been doing. Right, so there is a custom resource called a package install or even just an app. Uh, and then CAP Controller will go and install that. Thing. And if you want to take CAP Controller's rules and then put them into an Argo or a Flux universe, you can take those package install or those app custom resources and store them in your Git repository. And you can even do that alongside the all of the cap uh, or all of the YTT or all of the K build stuff, you can still all put that into the same repository and then get these two tools to work really well together and do your GitOps workflows or your registry op workflows or however you want to do things. Does that make sense? You know, but um, yeah, well, I think say? it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, you know, from my perspective, and I think one of the things is is that people look at cap controller what we were talking about here right this like imperative creating the packages all of that one of the great things though is that it is a full GitOps tool just like flux or argo cd um it does not have the other things that flux as a organization or of a set of tools or argo as a set of tools has it doesn't have argo workflows or argo rollouts or argo events or any of that but argo cd we completely have that within cap controller itself because the app CR actually just has the idea of fetch from a Git repository a Git and push, and yeah. it will pull the Git repo and apply it. So it has the idea of the Flux source controller and then the Flux deployer. It has everything in there, just like Flux, just like Argo have, we have those same capabilities. Um, we can also, for example, one of the things that I've uh, been working on recently um, is that if we look at cap controller, uh, one of the really cool things that we have within the documentation, um, is if I look at like the app CR, right. At what an app looks like, we have this idea here of, okay, cluster, which cluster am I actually going to target? So we could do multi cluster management. And I'm working on this now as a, you know, proof of concept from a, from a cluster API management cluster. So let's say the Tanzu Community Edition or Tanzu Kubernetes Grid Multi-Cloud or EKS Anywhere, whatever it is from that management cluster, which has automatically generated cube configs for all of my workload clusters. How could I deploy an app in my management cluster that deploys the actual manifests into the workload cluster for me? So how could I actually do GitOps without interacting with my workload cluster directly? How could I do GitOps against a single cluster to manage all my other clusters. Um, there will be a repo up of that hopefully within the next few weeks. Um, but this is the way you would do it. You would just add a cluster, add the cube config secret ref, um, and it would simply go and target that um, cube config when it goes and applies the resources and then reconcile it still from outside, reconcile it from the cluster that the app is deployed in um, and fetch. Again, we have this idea of Git. So just like with Flux or with Argo, or in Argo, for example, which I'm more you know keen to, um, in Argo, we have to create that app CRD for Argo, in Argo application, so that it knows which Git repository to listen to. We do the exact same thing with a cap controller app, and it will do the exact same thing. Um, and that way you get all these extra benefits. Um, Plus the K build and the SOPs and, you know, you could do. And you're not limited to Git, right? You're not limited to Git or Helm, yeah. right? Um, like Flux, I think, is only from Helm a, or Git. You know, a bucket or whatever you want, yeah. Exactly. If you have someone, if you're following GitHub releases, right? I don't want to be off of Git. I want to be off of a specific, like, release. Uh, so I'm just watching, like, the latest release of a specific something and the release artifact is always at latest, you know, releases, latest slash archive.tgz. I can always be just pulling that and seeing if the SHA changes and if it changes, pulling down the last release of an object without dealing with Git, right? Just dealing with it from an HTTP perspective, or if it wasn't an S3 blob or whatever it is, you could access it that way. You could access it from config maps or secrets. So we're more configurable than something like a Flux or Argo. 
because we aren't just a GitOps tool. It can be used for GitOps, but it could also be used for RegOps with an image package bundle, or it can be used for inline ops if you don't like to do things in a normal manner, or it could be done with HTTP or any of these other sources that make it really strong. Pretty cool stuff, very powerful. And of course, again, like tool is super composable. So if you need to fit this into an existing Flux or Argo workflow, um, uh, not literally the Argo workflow, but you know, however your organization gets stuff into a cluster, you can always, you know, dump the package install um, into your control repository and use Cap Controller alongside your things, and you know, have the freedom that every infrastructure engineer wants. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Scott, we've been yeah. coming up on you know questions are still just just flying in, but uh, you know, this is like two hours of streaming for you. Yeah. No, oh, this has been uh, this is a lot of fun. Um, I hope that it was clear and uh, interesting because I I think that this stuff is one of the things that I had mentioned. I think in a previous session, I don't remember if it was on Tuesday Tuesday, is that the only way that I can understand why ITT is because I drink whiskey. Um, it's got a strong learning curve, and whiskey helps me understand why ITT. There's no question about that. Um, well, you know, it takes some anybody. Time. Uh, I personally do not drink whiskey, and I also have gone down the YTT understanding journey. So <laughs> I was like, "Oh no, do I have to start drinking?" <laughs> uh, no, you know, some people don't. I do, but you know, um, and one of the interesting, you know, I think that you know, it can be a steep learning curve for your packaging. There's a lot to learn uh, in this world. Um, and it's a lot of layers. Um, but once we understand the layers, the tooling mm -hmm. that this gives us is so strong and the developer experience of those who are gonna deploy the applications we're creating is so much better, I think, mm -hmm. than other things that exist on the market mm -hmm. that it's worth learning because it just gives us so many extension points um, mm -hmm. that it just can really fit into our workflows. We don't need to change everything for it. We have a learning curve at the beginning, but once we learn these tools, we can then integrate the parts that make sense for us in our work streams and not need to change everything. We just need to understand the knobs that we can turn. Yeah, I really like that the Carvel tool set does not try to hide problems from you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think that when you adopt a set of tools and at first it might look a little complex, but then you discover that you had problems you didn't know you had, um, then that's like a very empowering experience. Yeah. So Carlos has a question that is now also something I'm wondering, what is it exactly about YTT that makes it so hard? I, I think that the hard part is bringing a, it's an issue that also exists within Helm. If you ask me, Helm charts are un, are completely ununderstandable when they get to you know large sizes, because the amount of templating logic being mixed in within YAML. Um, mm -hmm. I write code, I write YAML, but the two being mixed together has a huge strength. But adding in through like annotations in YAML, Pythonic language. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's easier to understand than Go templating of Helm, um, but it becomes very difficult when you get to these complex uh, templates and all this other logic. Um, mm -hmm. Also, YTT is much more strict than Helm. Helm has nothing in it to tell you that what it will generate is valid YAML. Mm -hmm. Everything in YTT that it generates will be valid YAML. Um, and understanding sometimes the safety guards that they put in. Um, for example, if you're like, there's this idea of an overlay that I want to find an object of a type deployment in these you know, resources and then change the replica count uh, mm -hmm. for a deployment. Well, if I ran that on a folder that has 10 deployments, by default, that's gonna fail because it's expecting to find one object of type deployment you have to say specifically expect one plus you mm -hmm. expect more than one object like this because it doesn't want you to make the mistake right it comes out of the idea that we're making it secure which i think is great but it adds a complexity to it 
of we want to make sure you don't make a mistake. If you're adding a new key, right, I'm overlaying a config map right now, and I add a new key to that config map. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties is, is that by default, it's not going to allow me to. And the reason is, it's going to say, well, did you want to actually add a new key? Or did you just make a typo and you were trying to actually update a key that already exists? And, mm -hmm. you know, you made a mistake here. You wrote sec instead of spec, right? Where was it? What was your actual mistake there? And so you have to say, allow missing, okay, right? That you allow it to, even if this is missing, I know and it's okay. You write that. So it's very declarative uh, in terms of what your intentions are. And understanding that or getting used to that is a steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once I you would, do, it makes sure your manifests these, are good. A lot of these reasons why YTT is hard are actually reasons why YTT is easy. Mm -hmm. um, it's just <laughs> like I, I'm actually planning to do a whole talk series on this. And um, I think when you compare, it's just it's it's a hard it's a hard sell for somebody you know to pick up a tool set that they don't know um yeah. and there are some things it's like when you're in the know when you advocate for something to be used you know oh the docs could be better or we need more examples in this area or gosh i mean like this is just a different way of thinking and when you compare it to what's in the ecosystem now whether it's jsonet uh, or Q or JK config, you know, some of these obscure templating languages, people, they don't know those. So then you've got customized, which is just like widely adopted somehow. Um, I, I kind of think how. it's a little bit unfortunate, but you know, it's, it's the hero we needed, but not the hero that we deserved kind of thing. Um, <laughs> the customize is so rigid. You know, all of these things that Scott was talking about where it's like, oh, if you wanted to do that, or if you wanted to do this, then you have to say so. You just can't do them in customize. Um, it's very hard to create a values YAML type abstraction without creating some ghost config map and you know like replace like adding a replacement <laughs> generator config and doing all of this crazy stuff in customize. You just can't do it. The tool's not. Mm -hmm. But YTT it lets you do it. YTT is a, a general tool. It's not a Kubernetes specific tool. You can use YTT on things that are not Kubernetes objects like GitHub action YAMLs or, you know, stuff that you feed into Terraform or whatever, everything is in YAML these days. And YTT is just an expert level Swiss army knife at dealing with YAML and JSON. Um, and Pommel and now, it supports yeah. Pommel. So you can even configure mm -hmm. your container deconfiguration if you needed to, or your Grafana LDAP configuration. Things mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm sure with YTT as well. Output, yeah. But um, anyway, it's like, it, the tool is just, awesome and i think that what we can do in the next couple uh, of months you know is just as the carvel community continues to expand and as people find an amazing experience you know and, and more leverage and more power as this like tool solves their problems uh, that we can improve the documentation you know that we can help the onboarding story uh, so that people are just a little bit less lost because mm -hmm. at the end of the day like the fact that you can literally rip something off the internet using vendor you know, like just mm -hmm. something from an HTTP route or something, and it, it spits into your directory and it tracks the SHA of it. And then you can immediately start using YTT to come up, customize that things. And, and everything is actually just the raw YAML that you did not have to write. Um, you end up in a, in a, all of the power of actual general purpose programming language uh, without the pain of converting your YAML into that programming language. Um, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. So. No, I am a huge fan of YTT, right? The fact that I, you know, the fact that I'm saying that it's difficult is not at all to say, I think it's the best tool in this field by far for templating. Um, it's people are scared of it though. Um, and because of that steep learning curve and the reason that I put all of the examples up on GitHub, the reason I'm doing all this, I think one of the reasons that, you know, it's hard for people to understand is that there are a million Helm charts out on GitHub that someone could look at to see how they do something. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of examples yet on the internet of a Carvel package or of a YTT overlay file. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's the great thing with TCE. That's the great thing with the, all of this stuff that's slowly coming out and we're getting more resources out there. And I think that it will become much easier when you have a, when Carvel packages get added into Artifact Hub, um, things will be much easier because then everything gets into there. It gets the exposure. It's, oh, you install this through a single command. Like people, that's how operators became big outside of OpenShift when they were added into Artifact Hub and then someone saw, oh, I can install it in this other way. Okay, there's instructions. It's not Elm, but I can figure it out. And you learn that way. Um, I think the same thing will happen here. Hopefully Carvel will be added into Artifact Hub would be my hope. And that, you know, we start to see more community examples at which point it becomes very easy then uh, to onboard someone into the tools because they have examples out there. They have real life examples because as much as any project has their demos, uh, you know, Cap, Hat, uh, Carvel have their Kubernetes demo app. Um, you know, they're cute. It's like the Tanzu Java web app that came with Tanzu application platform. It's cute. It has nothing to do with a real world application that anyone's <laughs> going to create. Um, but, it, you know, it gives you the general idea and it serves its purpose. But, okay, now I need to package up WordPress. I need to package up a multi-tier application. I need to package up my polyglot link, uh, you know, container. I need to do whatever it is. You're lost right now because you don't have those examples. When they come out, then it becomes much easier. Hopefully. Anyways, yeah, this was awesome. This is always yeah. so good. Yeah. I'm glad to know you'll be coming back again in, in March. So I don't have to feel sad that it's your last uh, Tanzu Tuesday. You're like an honorary host at this point, Scott. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I'll be coming on with Robert and uh, a few other people to uh, talk about Kubernetes availability on vSphere and talking about different things uh, in that sphere, which will be very interesting topic that I've been spending a lot of time looking into on how to deal with this whole idea of availability zones and, you know, storage and all these things when you're running on premise, when you manage things, uh, storage is not infinite when you're on premise. Uh, you do not have the same SLAs as you get from public cloud vendors, or they may be better if you're running in AWS in Virginia. Um, because that crashes many times a year. Um, but otherwise, you know, usually clouds have better SLAs. So how do you deal with that type of thing on premise? So that'll be a cloud session also. That type of thing on premise. So that'll be a cloud session. You... What just happened there? I don't know. It I sounded like the, the Twitch broadcast was echoing for a second. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I um I know we need to raid and I I chose a .NET developer to raid um but then they just went offline so I'm I'm not prepared I was prepared and I'm now unprepared but it seems as though what I'm what I'm seeing in terms of people to raid are all gamers and not developers um because no, I think in the middle of the day. Yeah, yeah yeah you don't have to raid today <laughs> yeah I think it's not we don't, we don't want to send send off all of our uh, tech nerds uh, streaming over the VPN on their corporate <laughs> machines into a Valorant, you know, uh, stream. Yeah. <laughs> Next time we'll be more. Well, yeah, I'll try again. Live, you learn. Yeah. Well, uh, is, is there anything else you wanted to, to leave the our, our stalwart audience? We still have quite a few people here chilling, uh, hanging out. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, I think we've done a good amount of stuff for today. Obviously, I you know me, I have another seven GitHub repos that could be talked about, but uh, I think that we're good for today. <laughs> yeah, you've heard of GitOps, but have you heard of Git Demo? It's like, it's going to be the next wave. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, awesome. uh, thanks, Robert, for sticking around. Uh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Carlos, for coming too. Thanks, Vitaly yeah. Thomas. Vitaly Thomas, thanks for jumping in. It's awesome, that, you know, just having so much engagement with the questions. It really it adds a lot to the stream. Just know if you're tuning in uh, and, and, you, and you're getting involved, you're, you're talking about where you're from, where you're tuning in, what you did last week, 
asking asking great questions for our guests. Uh, that you're definitely part of the stream too. Thanks for being here, part of Tonsu Tuesdays. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Well, I and guess then, it's time for the uh, stinger. You know. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna. Carlos is coming on as a guest March 17th. He's big in the K Native community. Oh. He's gonna be my guest on my uh, enlightening show on Thursday. Uh, very nice. So, very yeah, nice. March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. You can be like, oh, Carlos and Whitney are gonna do a stream together. So awesome. yeah, thank you for I'm for stoked back. for for um, to to be more enlightened. Yeah. <laughs> All right, peace out, friends. Thanks, thanks for sticking with us. Bye.